Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction there um, and the opportunity to, to speak at this meeting. So, yeah, my name's Mike. I'm a uh, software developer at the uh, European Molecular Biology Laboratory um, in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, and I principally uh, work with the, the language R um, and the Bioconductor Project. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about what, what those are and then um, give a use case of, of how we use HDF5 um, in some of the work we do. Um, so I guess the, the audience here is perhaps slightly different from what I normally talk to. So I wanted to give a little intro to what R itself is um, in case people aren't familiar with that. So it's a, it's a statistical programming language. It's actually been around for about 25 years, um, but it continues to kind of grow in popularity and things. So it's, it's not only a programming language, but also an environment where you can, you can uh, interact with your code pretty, pretty easily. Um, so it's been really helpful for um, things like interactive data exploration and rapid prototyping and that kind of thing. And just some examples of how rapid I mean, um, these, these little code chunks here, um, if you open R type plot one to 10, it would produce the plot on the right hand side. There's no compilation required. There's no um, deciding what device driver to use and things. It will just create a plot and open it on your screen. Um, and similarly, many um, statistical methods, for instance, are also built in, they're baked into the kind of core of R. Um, so for instance, if you typed mean one to 10, it will just come back with the result for you. And there's obviously many more sophisticated tests than just calculating the mean. Um, but the, and, th and this has been really helpful. It's, it's really been uh, like this kind of way of, of manipulating your data and interacting with it and kind of exploring is, is really one of the cornerstones of why the language has been successful. Um, but the other kind of part to that is the, the ease with which people can write add-on packages. Um, and so there are now tens of thousands of, of additional packages um, which kind of expand the language. Um, most of these can be found in a place called CRAN, um, which is kind of the, the home for, for where these things should live. Um, but also people write them and put them on GitHub and this kind of thing. Um, and as I say, there's tens of thousands of them. They cover a huge range of topics. So not only statistical applications and things, but interfaces with particular file formats, um, databases, web scraping, um, pretty much anything you can sort of imagine doing with a computer, someone's probably tried to do it to, to a, some extent in R and put it in a package somewhere. Um, and most of the time, these are pretty easy to install. Most users of R have to do this almost immediately because they want to do something slightly outside of the standard language. And you just type in install package and then the name and R goes off, downloads it and installs it for you. Um, so it's a pretty familiar way for, for people to work with it. And I think these two things, this interactivity and the the ease with which we can use packages is really the success behind R. Um, and then the Bioconductor project is a thing which kind of runs parallel to R, but outside of it. Um, so it's all rooted in R, but it's essentially at its core, a, a separate repository outside of CRAN, really focused on biological research. Um, and it's got a few more rules. If you want your software to be in there, um, it has to meet certain requirements for documentation, it has to pass daily checks on a continuous integration system and things. Um, and there's a review done by members of the team to sort of uh, make sure that certain minimum criteria are met um, with the intention to make better software and hopefully then improve the, the kind of user experience for, for people that just want to use the software and don't care about the development side of things. Um, and one of the kind of really things they're really strong on is uh, emphasizing code reuse and modularization within the project. So core infrastructure, things like reading specific file types um, or classes that represent common data types. One person should kind of maintain them, develop them, one or more people, but there should be one implementation of that. Um, and then hopefully people aren't reinventing the wheel um, or um, kind of proliferating things which are very similar, but have slightly different interfaces or APIs and things can't work together. Um, and an interface to HDF5 kind of falls into this category, right? A specific data type that many people might want to use. Um, and so that brings me to the RHDF5 package. Um, and there's two things I want to mention here. First is that a lot of this work was done by Bernd Fischer before I became the maintainer. Um, and second, it's not the only package in R that can do all of this, but it's the one I look after and it's the one I'm going to talk about today. And actually, when I talk about one package, RHDF5, really, I'm talking about three interconnected packages. So um, there's RHDF5 itself and then two which kind of support it and provide additional features. Um, 
And I'll start with our HDF5 lib, um, which is actually um, our way of distributing the HDF5 library to our users. Um, so inside there, there's a kind of trimmed version of the HDF5 source code. Um, currently that's version 1.10.6. Um, and I do this, we distribute it this way um, for two kind of major reasons. One is to ensure a consistent version for users. So when people, um, send me questions uh, about what's going wrong. I can narrow down, at least I know what version of HDF5 they're using um, without, uh, and then I can diagnose what else might be happening kind of thing. Um, and it also ensures a kind of consistent set of instructions for the users. Um, I don't have to try and ask them to work out how to install it on their operating system. They just run the install packages our HDF5 lib command that they're familiar with from installing our packages. And it goes and does this for them. Um, and in, uh, it goes and compiles the, the library for Linux and Mac platforms, and then it basically is distributed with a pre-compiled version um, for Windows, which just gets copied over to a location within which R knows about. Um, and generally, this seems to work quite well as a way of sort of simplifying installations for my users. And to accompany that, there's also a, another package called RHDF5 filters, um, which distributes some of the kind of dynamic compression plugins and things that um, we've heard mentioned a few different times in, in different talks throughout this meeting. Um, so in there, there's the, the BZIP2, uh, LZF and BLOSK filters, um, which are also the source code is distributed with it. It gets built on all of the platforms and, and is made available to users when they use this package. And it does this by setting the, um, the HDF5 plugin path environment variable within their R session. So um, once they load the package, this is available and for, for reading and writing for anything else they want to do with HDF5 files. Um, and actually you can use this with external programs. It would be a bit of a weird way to, um, to install these, but I've tested it and you, you can use the shared objects that are distributed with it um, in other programs outside of R if you want to do that. And so then I come to the real meat of this, the, the RHDF5 package itself. Um, so this provides um, what I'm gonna call high and low level interfaces. Um, this definition got a bit confused when the high level API was released by HDF5 themselves. Um, but the, what I call the low level things are basically mappings, R functions, which have exactly the same name as common um, parts of the C API. Um, so they, they all have a capital H5 and then whatever they're trying to do. And it's essentially, if you look at that kind of code, it should look very familiar if you know the C interface. And then the high level functions will have a lowercase h5 um, and they kind of wrap up some of the common operations that our users might want to do and make kind of default choices for them uh, to hopefully simplify the process um, of, of interacting with an HDF5 file for a, a relatively novice user. And to just give some examples of the kind of these, these two interfaces and what the code would look like, this is using the kind of low level C API ma mapping kind of thing. Um, where hopefully, even if you don't know R code, this looks pretty familiar. You have H5 create to create a file, you create a data space, you create a data set, and you, you get returned a handle to these kind of HDF5 objects, which um, you would then have to look after and close at the end. And if you don't do this, you run into problems with files that you've left open and this kind of thing. This should be very familiar to, I guess, people that use the C level API, but not necessarily to people that work in R, where things like closing files are probably handled for them uh, most of the time. And so the kind of the wrapper functions, the slightly higher level interface to things, um, those same multiple lines we saw before could be um, easily done with H5 create file would just make an empty HDF5 file at a particular place. An H5 write uh, will create a, a data set there. And if this was a longer path, it would create the groups in the hierarchy down to that data set. Um, and we'll pick things like the data type and things based upon the class of uh, whatever R structure you're trying to write in there. So in this case, it would be integers and it would use an integer data set. And analogously, there's an H5 read. You can point it to a file and the name of the data set you're trying to read, and it will just pull all of the data out of that and represent it in R with um, whatever dimension and data type was, uh, is present in the, uh, in the original file. So if you're only interested in HDF5 and R, and maybe um, uh, you're kind of, it's piqued your interest, but you're not interested in biology, you can probably stop listening at this point. Um, but I now kind of want to just go into a, 
a quick example use case of how we actually use this in, in, in the bioconductor project um, with, with single cell sequencing. Um, and so for this, um, just a quick overview of what single cell sequencing is. So uh, we would start with a particular tissue type. In this example, it's, it's a brain tumor. Um, and we ex take an extraction of that. Um, and what we're able to do is take that collection of tissue and break it down into the individual cells, um, which is represented here. And for the, the colors here represent something unique about this particular population of cells. So it might be the type of cell it is, it might be the lineage in a tumor revolution or something along those lines, but there's something unique or different between the different colors here. And what we're able to do is look at the RNA seq, or sorry, the RNA or the DNA within each of those individual cells um, and end up essentially with a representation of how much of each gene is present in each cell. So the, these are counts and you end up with a, a number of counts for each gene for each cell. And so this is just a single data point here, um, but obviously we have many cells and we have many genes in each of those cells. So instead of single data points, we end up with a, a two dimensional matrix full of integer numbers um, representing the abundance of, of each gene within each cell. And what people want to do beyond this point uh, our myriad, there is lots of different things people will be looking at depending upon the biological question they're asking. Um, but the core central point here is this, this counts matrix, um, which is kind of the output from any single cell experiment that we're interested in, in doing. And this is where the, the, the ecosystem of Bioconductor comes in. Some people got together and decided to design a class that would represent this count data um, and, and the information that would always be common in this kind of um, kind of a situation where you've got an experiment like this. Um, and so this picture is a little bit chaotic, but uh, essentially uh, most things are just metadata. They're the names of genes, or they're the there's some information about where the cell came from, what time something was recorded, something along those lines. But this big blue square in the middle, this is the counts matrix. This is what we saw from uh, the, the previous slide. Um, and this would be present all the time, right? This, this count matrix of, of integer values. Um, and that's kind of the core raw data from these experiments. And um, there's some interesting kind of properties of these, these data um, of this count matrix. So typically they're, they're super sparse. Um, mostly like 90% at least will probably be zeros. Um, and also the size of the, the matrices themselves can change a lot. So the, the number of genes varies a lot depending upon what, your, what organism you're working with and what you're interested in doing with that. And the number of cells can also vary uh, hugely um, from tens of cells up to millions of cells. And so for small data sets where we're talking hundreds to thousands of cells, um, these can mostly be represented in memory in R and it works fine. Um, you can either use dense matrices in R or, or there are sparse representations which also work quite nicely um, given the kind of um, huge number of zeros we have in this data. But for large data sets and large, I guess I'm talking more than a million cells and human sized genomes, so 30,000 genes, we need another solution. Um, so for those numbers, that would be about 100 gigs in, in memory, which most people can't work with, um, even on a, a decent kind of desktop computer kind of thing. And we're talking most people are working on laptops in their, um, in their labs. Um, so 100 gigs of memory isn't, isn't appropriate, and the sparse representations in R also can't actually handle this number of data points because they're limited by 32-bit uh, indexing. So we need another solution, and HDF5 is, is a really good solution to, to fill this, this niche for us. Um, and so there's, there's another package, um, which is also part of this and, and builds on top of the work that I look after in, in our HDF5, which is the HDF5 array package. It's specifically designed for representing um, either 2D matrices or, or, or multi-dimensional arrays of, of counts. And it basically works as a drop-in replacement for the in-memory arrays that people are used to working with in R. Um, and it works by having a constructor that gets pointed to a single data set within an HDF5 file. So this code on the right-hand side is a, is a demo of how one would go about doing it. And at this point when it's run, nothing is actually read from disk. Um, it just creates an object that represents a matrix, but people can work with it in very familiar ways if you work with R. So this square bracket um, notation is subsetting a matrix. Um, this would get you the first 10 rows. And if someone runs this operation, it will read the first 10 rows from our on disk matrix. 
Um, and similarly, many of the um, summary statistics like mean uh, are also implemented to work on an on-disk matrices. So upstream analysis packages where people are doing research, um, biological research, don't necessarily need to care whether they're working in memory or working on disk with HDF5 backed arrays. Um, in practice, some of the algorithms really need to be optimized, um, and many of them are, but that's something that's definitely still a, a work in progress to make things uh, efficient when they switch to on-disk access. Um, and so just as a kind of summary of this, this stack uh, of software and the things I've kind of glossed over a bit. So on the right-hand side, uh, loads of different analysis tools, all of which are doing something with single cell data. Um, and they're written by a large number of different developers um, with different questions, um, but all of them interface with the single cell experiment object. Um, and that can happily interface with our, our counts matrices in HDF5 array, and then that sits on top of our HDF5 and our own distribution of the HDF5 library. Um, and if anybody is interested in working with HDF5 in R, you can kind of jump in at any point in this, um, in this stack here. So if you wanted to just work with um, non-biological data, you can jump in at our HDF5, and if you wanted to work single cell experiment, you can work here or anywhere else on this, um, on this diagram. So that's my presentation. Thanks very much for listening. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mike. All right, we have time for questions. Uh... Hey, Mike, uh, this is John Reedy from HF Group. I was curious, uh, is there interest in um, this kind of analysis in the cloud or is it mainly uh, in the lab environment now? Yeah, so the, I think there definitely is interest in, in doing it in the cloud. Um, there seems to be more and more movement towards um, putting the data in the cloud. Um, and then, as I say, some of these are, are huge, but people are actually only interested in tiny subsets of them. They might be interested in a particular gene across multiple cells um, or a subset of those cells that have a particular property and then they want to work with them later. Um, but yeah, I definitely think there is... Um, uh, potential and interest in not having to move this data to people's laptops and that kind of thing. Right, right. I only if you know there was, there was a version of uh, RHDF that was developed uh, for use with uh, the HSDS uh, server. Um, I think there's not been a lot of progress on it recently, but uh, the idea is to have the same API, but instead of going to a local file, it would go off to a server. In the cloud. Yeah, so um, I, th I think I remember. Um, yeah, I'll put a link in the chat for it. So I, I don't know anything about it. I think I associate your name with the package, um, <laughs> or at least discussions I, I about have, it. I have your line of code for it. Right. right. Um, but I, I, yeah, so I do not have anything to do with that, but I'm, I'm heavily involved in the project. Um, so if there is um, interest in bringing that back to life and things, I would definitely be part of the discussion. Okay, great. Any other questions? If not, I have one question related to the HDFI RA. So uh, what kind of optimizations are you thinking about? Is uh, the in-memory representation memory map with the file or file level or? or any caching going on? Uh, so, so no, essentially there's very little. Um, so the, I guess the only optimizations we do is try and make sure that um, we iterate through a file um, linearly. So when we, if, if, if people, it's common in R to want to pick out random um, columns or, or rows out of a matrices, right? That, that's, that's pretty common operation. And so that's really inefficient if you start reading chunks, for instance, and you, you end up, if you do that in a random order, you read the, the same chunk over and over again and that kind of thing. So we try to make sure we at least pass through the, the file in a kind of consistent manner. Um, but essentially we read a chunk at a time, take the data we're interested in, um, and then read the next chunk and discard from memory the, the chunk we just read. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think there's probably plenty of, of good engineering that could be applied to make this a lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. And uh, any other questions for Mike? 